Buonasera a tutti, good evening and welcome to the Italian Radio Hour. Io sono Viviana and I would like to welcome back our listeners and also welcome any new listeners and anyone listening online at khbradio.com. Also, be sure to like us on Instagram and Facebook at the Italian Radio Hour and subscribe to our YouTube channel to catch up on any past episodes. Vorrei dare il benvenuto ai nostri ascoltatori da tutto il mondo. Grazie per essere con noi anche oggi, mentre continuiamo il nostro viaggio per l'Italia e la cultura italiana. Well, last week we had a very interesting conversation about the importance of growing a vegetable garden in the Italian-American culture. We had wonderful guest Mary Meniti, founder of the Italian Garden Project, uh, cookbook author Rosetta Costantino, and the director of the documentary Heirloom, Michaela Smith. But before we get to tonight's guest, let's find out the answer to last week's trivia question. What is it the meaning of Se come il prezzemolo mean? Well, if you translate it literally, it means you are like parsley. And um, uh, what does uh, imply? Imply that you turn up everywhere. So parsley is a very common ingredient found in many Italian dishes. So if you are like parsley, it means you're just minding everyone's business and you're always in their way. Well, tonight we have a very special guest, a dear friend, uh, Anna Harsh. She is a professional dancer and artistic director of Allegro Dance Company. And recently she published her first book, La Danza, Conflict, Passion and Healing. Ma prima pubblicità. Parli italiano? Do you want to learn, improve or master your Italian? Istituto Mondo Italiano can help. Located in the heart of Region Square, Mondo Italiano offers small group classes and one-on-one -on -one private tutoring to help you learn Italian in no time. Visit us online at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org. Well, welcome back everyone. I am very pleased to bring uh, to you my dear friend, Anna Harsh. Anna Harsh is a professional dancer and artistic director of Allegro Dance Company. She is the author of La Danza, Conflict, Passion and Healing. With over three decades of research and teaching experience, Anna offers a unique and refreshing voice in the Italian American community on how to preserve Italian traditional dancers for the next generation. She holds a Master of Arts uh, degree in Communication from West Virginia University, a Bachelor of Arts degree in Dance, in dance from Slippery Rock University, and an RY200 in Yoga, and she's also a Certified Pilates Instructor. She has traveled extensively throughout Italy to research and study dances from various regions. Her adventurous personality and passion for her Italian heritage has taught her unique life lessons. And her work has been featured in magazines such as Frannoi, Ambassador, and Dance Spirit. Welcome to the show, Anna. Buonasera. Buonasera. Ciao, ciao. How are you? I'm doing very well. You know that this interview is overdue. Um, I uh, congratulate you for your, your book, which, as you can see, is right I here. love it. I see it. <laughs> And uh, uh, but before we dive into the book, I do have um, quite a few questions for you. The first one, Anna Harsh, help me uh, establish your connection to Italy. Well, M Harsh is my married name. So <laughs> my um, former name was Pishner. But when my four grandparents came over, my grandfather on my father's side, originally his name was Piscioneri. Ah. which I think means black fish or something of that connection. Yes. Maybe we show something about patient, nero, mm -hmm, black. Maybe. Correct. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but they all came from Calabria in the early 1920s and um, <clears throat> came for jobs. You know, uh, one set of grandparents had an arranged marriage and my grandmother went through with it. She's brave, right? And the other grandparent, my other grandmother on my mother <clears throat> on my mother's side, did not go through with it. Mm -hmm. So she married a friend of hers, and he said, "No problem." They they were good friends in Calabria, and so they got together, and they had nine children. And my father's mother and father they had four children. So 
um, yeah, that's my connection. And, um, you know, growing up Italian American is quite different from growing up just Italian. And so, you know, when I go to my grandparents' house, I had to speak a little bit of Italian, wasn't much because I was really small, but I spoke a little Italian. And then when you come home, you speak English because they really wanted you to acclimate into the United States and be the best you can be and really, you know, be an American now. So it was really challenging to live in two worlds for a long time. Yes, it is. I mean, on one hand, it's a treasure because we can enjoy the best of both worlds. But on the other hand, it's this fluid, there's a certain fluid flu, flow and very fluid. <laughs> That's what it was, a fluidity yeah. Uh, yeah. between the two, uh, the two personalities that we end up uh, developing and right. coexist. So uh, tell, let's talk a little bit about your, um, your beginning in the um, dance world. You're professionally, you know, you're classically uh, trained uh, dancer. So um, at what point did you, uh, fe did you feel these um, drawn towards Italian folk dances, not because you were of Italian American, was there right. something specific that maybe made you think that that's how the direction you wanted to take your career? Well, I always knew that I wanted to be a dancer. I think coming out of the womb, it was kind of like, yeah, this, this is what calls me. This is what moves me literally. And, um, you know, at every family dinner, aunts and uncles would come over. That's what we would do. Some kind of tarantella from Calabria or, you know, sing and dance and that sort of thing. After dinner was kind of like, you know, a celebration moment. So we would always do that. I just, I didn't know any other way. It was just always there. So I didn't know anything different. I didn't know other people did not do that perhaps after dinner or, you know, didn't do that every weekend or whatever. And then as I got into college and I wanted to major in dance, I thought, okay, well, maybe my process is going to be this route. And then when I got to do my college thesis, they had, Anna, you have to pick a, a subject. And I thought, well, this is a no brainer. I'm going to pick Italian dance and how you can show so much about a culture just by watching their folk dances or their cultural dances. And so as I started researching, I found no books in the United States about any kind of Italian folk dances, um, maybe some Renaissance dances, but nothing real specific. And I was looking for, you know, Calabrian Tarantella or, you know, a Sicilian Tarantella, anything. And Every library I called from the across the United States gave me the same one line, you know, the Tarantella is about a, a spider and, you know, bitten by the spider and you do this dance. Mm -hmm. And that was about it. That's all they could tell me. And the internet didn't exist. So I was kind of like, well, where do I go from here? You know, so I realized it was way more than I thought it would be. So I called a few friends that did study in Italy, did dance, had, had um, companies, you know, uh, like a Campagnoli out of Pittsburgh that were, you know, touring and traveling for years. And so Jane Farrow was the director at the moment. And I called her and had an interview over the phone for my college dorm. And I said, Jane, you know, what can I do? What can I find? And she gave me a beautiful dance called Bala de la Conca. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's from the Abruzzi region where women would go to and from the well, it has a three, four waltz kind of rhythm, and they would carry those basins on top of their heads. Yeah, the conca, that's exactly The conca, it. right. It's a copper, it's a copper, um, yes, uh, water. Uh, water basin. jug kind of thing. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty large in size. Um, but unfortunately, you know, I, I couldn't go to Italy as a college student right away and get these <laughs> basins to carry on her head. So we used baskets as a representation of that to improvise a little bit, but she gave me a lot of research that I could get my college thesis done and started and all of that good stuff and have a beautiful show because I had to present it as a college showcase. Mm -hmm. I had to write a paper, you know, it was a thesis project. You were graded upon it and my degree depended on it. So <laughs> Uh, I performed it and some beautiful dancers that were also dance majors with me performed these beautiful dances that she gave us. And one of my professors, uh, who was a folk dancer, 
uh, him and his wife encouraged me to, Hey, Anna, why don't you take this to a festival and get some feedback in real life, you know, and see, see what you can do with it. So I did took it to my hometown in Clarksburg, West Virginia at the time and did it for their Italian festival that year. And they had the same reaction that I did like, Hey, I really connect with what you're saying and all these beautiful dances. Uh, how can we see more? And I was like, more, I, I just was finishing a project, you know, this wasn't supposed to be a thing. <laughs> and so I quickly had to turn around and ask a lot of friends, Hey, can you, can you do this again? Yes. And again, <laughs> and again, and again. So that was, yeah. that was wonderful. So, um, well, just, uh, um, initially again, when you, uh, got started professionally to, uh, to have shows and so forth, um, how challenging or how easy was it to find indeed uh, dancers that would embrace this type of dancing? And um, did they all have an Italian American background or were also, I don't know, college kids that were like, yes, let's do it. That sounds interesting. Yeah, um, a little bit of both. You know, in, in West Virginia, in that area, it's loaded with Italian Americans because many Italians you know, settled in that region of the Appalachian region because of jobs in coal mining and all kinds of things. So um, many of the families, you know, that I was friends with were also Italian Americans. So they're like, this is a no brainer. Yeah, of course, I want to participate and show my pride and heritage and, and also participate into dance or theater, you know, they loved it, they loved performing. Um, Many of the dancers also were not Italian, but they just loved Italian food. We were friends for years. And so they were like, well, this sounds different and kind of fun. Yeah, I'm in. So we got to costuming and, and you know, all those things that go into a business and a touring company that kind of evolved over the years. But at first, yeah, it was pretty easy to find people and, um, college students or people that graduated from college that were like, yeah, I'm home for the summer and this sounds fun. Um, so, I mean, maybe we can tell the audience that for just a very short period of time, I was, I had the pleasure to join your group and it's so, um, it's so refreshing. Um, it is so, it, it's an experience that uh, I can't describe without a smile on my face. Aww. Because um, uh, from the, the preparation to uh, wearing the costumes and you kind of get into that role and every right. dance takes you to a different region or to different mannerisms. And you're so careful in making sure our hands are in a certain way, the feet are pointing in a certain way to give uh, the most authentic rendition of right. the, uh, these dances. So what does a typical program of um, the Allegro Dance uh, Company like when you um, perform at a show? What, what goes into um, what you want to uh, get your audience to experience and understand? Right, exactly what you said, to be the most authentic that I can bring what it's like to dance in Italy, what these dances showcase from different region to region. And, you know, being as precise as I can with the dancers, like you said, from the heads to the fingers, to where we should look, how you should hold your partner, how you should look and smile and when not to smile, maybe it's something about something else, you know. Um, and some of the steps, you kind of have to let go of your technical training as a, you know, classical ballet or classical jazz. You kind of have to let that go for some of the dances because it has a different technique altogether. Mm -hmm. So I have to not only teach that, but also, like you said, the feeling of the dance, you know, what are we trying to say? What's the story about? Mm -hmm. Is it about love? Is it about a battle? Is it about sickness? You know, and, and you're healing someone in the middle. Um, so it's different stories and we have to kind of take on those characters. So it's a little bit of acting as well, right? Mm -hmm. To go on stage and the dancers go through rehearsals a lot. <laughs> and so there's a lot of preparation, as you know, a lot of training and, and getting ready. And then there's the costumes, you know, layer to it. Yes. And then sometimes we use our costumes in the dance, you know, you swish your skirt or, you know, or hold on to a vest. Or, yes. Yeah. Yes. So let's uh, actually dive in into maybe a couple of dances. Um, if you can actually describe them, maybe if you can choose one dance from the south and one dance from the north uh, to see what the audience should pick as being the main 
uh, differences. And maybe I see that behind you, um, there is a collection of tambourines. And uh, I don't know if you want to either hum the rhythms or give yeah, us- Yeah, I can yeah. talk the audience through a little bit of what you know goes into it. There's a little hole on the side of the tambourine. That's where your finger should go. And then your thumb grasps over the other side. And I have a little spider painted that I did on my tambourine. Um, just to remind the audience, you know, that in the southern parts, the seven southern regions of Italy um, dance a tarantella, and it's not found in the north. This is just a special dance that has many variations in the south, but it's about this spider. Um, bitten by, if you're bitten by the spider, you would do these convulsive moves. And this tambourine kind of represents that, that we start in a circle uh, like the tambourine and the tambourine I believe was originally a sifter for flour yes. so it was like this you know and you would play it like this like side to side. Now that you're mentioning that there is indeed the, you go to many regions and in you know, antique stores or those that still have them yeah there are these big sifters for the grain and the flour yes so they use that in some of the dances to showcase what they did for a living or who they were or what their day was like so they might have their sifter and and bang on the side of it um in sicily they'll do the uh bring the tambourine to the front like this and they have a rhythm like one mm -hmm. it's like one two one two three one two one two three Can you one more time uh, closer to the microphone mm -hmm. Okay, it's it's coming through a little um, quiet, but we can, uh, yes, we can yeah. see the difference, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I always talk about the tambourine. I use it when I teach little ones, when we're talking to children, because many of our folk dances start in a circle, just like a tambourine shape. And then there's those little symbols all the way around the tambourine that show us that we need a partner. We need each other in the community. So it says something about the Italian community as well, that, you know, when you need help, you, there's always someone there to say, what do you need? How can I help you? Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, so this is uh, from the South. Uh, what is one of your favorite dances from the North? From the North, there's so many beautiful dances. Um, I think you got a chance to participate in La Ferlana. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Which is from the Veneto re region. Um, so I added those Venetian masks to showcase, you know, talking about the dark plague, you know, the black plague at the time and why they wore the masks to protect themselves. And we've kind of gone through that the last few years ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, so beautiful masks are worn. It's a three, four, uh, three, four tempo. So it's a waltz, beautiful waltz tempo. The posture is quite different. You're very upright and prominent, almost like a ballet feel to it. It's not as old as the Southern dances because the Southern dances are maybe thousands of years old. The Northern regions aren't going to be as old and they do take aspects from other countries, mm -hmm. you know, maybe France or um, Germany and those types of regional countries right on the border there. But um, it has an upright posture, very prominent. She's very tall and her partner only connects through that scarf. They only touch via the scarf. They never mm -hmm. actually touch hands yes. throughout that whole dance, which is kind of romantic in a way, but I think it was also to protect each other from <laughs> that leg. <laughs> that learned from them. <laughs> yeah. So we have learned a lot from that dance from the North, you know, so it's a different posture, a different attitude. Like you were saying, you know, you might have a different kind of smile or facial expression mm -hmm. or in the Southern regions, it's very grounded and earthy and knees are bent and vivacious and a little more vibrant. Yes. And also when we talk about Italian folk dances, people, I'm from Rome. So in Rome, I've never seen anyone picking up, you know, obviously maybe if you go to a wedding, but it's very, right. you know, not that casual, but then right. you go down to the Salento region where there is the Notte della Taranta. Right. It is indeed a big deal. I mean, so smaller um, uh, territories have maintained, and they're very proud of maintaining these uh, these traditions. And it's fascinating. I mean, the art that goes into it, and then the generational link, because it's usually 
this uh, passing on to the next generation. Uh, so obviously all this research that you did, it didn't just happen in libraries. Eventually <laughs> that um, led you to uh, go to Italy. When was that? And can you tell us a little bit about your trip to Italy? Right. Um, well, I first went to Italy in sixth grade. My mom and my brother and I ventured to go finally meet our family. My grandparents had all passed away by then. And, um, you know, my mom was just like, well, I want to see what their family was. You know, who did they leave behind? So we did. We, we traveled all the way over there. We went to different cities um, from Milan to Venice, Florence, Rome. And then we took another flight into Calabria, into Crotone, uh, where my family is uh, living on like a little um, farm to table kind of area. And they have a whole piece of land that they live off the land and they do everything. Like you were talking about gardens earlier. My goodness, from gardens to um, farming large crops to animals, raising animals and all kinds of things. So we got a chance to meet them. And then um, once I got out of college, I realized from that research and that experience of calling those libraries, gosh, I need to go. I just need to go and do more myself. And so I, I've taken several trips to Italy now, and I have several teachers that are in the um, Campania region. Mm -hmm. and um, have introduced me to all kinds of dances that I never even knew existed. Mm -hmm. So I am so thankful for them. And they keep in touch with me via social media today. You know, hey, Anna, what about this dance? You should try this. Or, you know, I'll show them a video and they're like, that's great. Fix your arm here. Make sure they do this, you know, and they really talk me through how I can make it better each time I perform it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, it's it's what you're doing is indeed you're documenting it, um, in a way that it can be passed on and only just enjoy it. But again, um, someone else might decide to follow your steps and you might be there. Maybe. Yeah, and I always say I'm I, leaving my little dance prints behind instead of <laughs> footprints, we leave dance prints behind. So maybe the next Anna would want to pick up where I left off and, and do more. My goal is to have all 20 regions you know, and have something from every little region so that I can see what it's like to really be Italian from head to toe, <laughs> from the whole boot. Well, indeed, indeed. So let's get to talk about uh, the, uh, the book. First of all, again, congratulations on, on, on the book. And I just wanted uh, to read uh, maybe uh, a praise for uh, La Danza, Conflict, Passion and Healing. Uh, also coming from Melissa Marinaro, who is the director of the Italian American program at the Senator John Hines History Center, who was also a guest on our show. And she says, La Danza, Conflict, Passion and Healing shares Anna's story of connecting with her Italian heritage through movement and dance. Part memoir, part guide, Harsh reminds us that the Tarantella and other folk dances are just as healing as Nonna's recipes and worthy of preservation for the next generation. La Danza adds a new voice to the canon of Italian American memoir writing. So with uh, this introduction, let's talk about how the book came about. Um, what was happening in your life, both personally and professionally? Yeah, the, the book has been on my mind for, for many years, and it was never the right time to sit down and, and put it all into words, I think. And then the pandemic happened, and everything stopped, including all of our shows um, and the whole world. Basically, I felt like it paused for just <laughs> a little while before it kept moving again. So it gave me a chance and an opportunity. I said, maybe this is my opportunity that it's presenting itself to write. Mm -hmm. And so it flowed and came out pretty quickly because um, there was so many journeys. There was so many adventures that I wanted to tell about Allegro and just about these beautiful dances too. Cause I thought, gosh, I hope somebody in the future wants to know about these things too, when they arrive or, you know, um, as a young college student or young student, maybe they want to know about these dances and kind of connect like I did, like, oh, that's why I like these things, or that's why I like to do this. So I put it all into a book. And the book is basically a reflection 
almost of a documentary I did in 2015. Mm -hmm. And so in 2015, I, I started on this journey of doing a documentary because many people said, Anna, you know, it's great that you're teaching these dances and they do learn them from person to person, but you know, what happens when you're not here? Mm -hmm. Oh, true. Okay. So I made a video and I didn't know anything about documentaries, but, um, I did my best and, um, got a documentary done. I think it's one of the only documentaries in the United States about this subject matter. Um, so there's that, I guess, you know, you have to be the first at something to crack, crack the ceiling open. Right. Okay. So, um, after the documentary kind of came about, um, many people asked me when I was presenting it at screenings, Hey, do you have a book version, you know, about this documentary and your travels and tours? And I thought, no, not yet. And I do want to do that, but it's just not the time. And so the pandemic kind of opened up the time and space for me to sit down and type it all out and stop moving for a second and really concentrate on the book. Mm -hmm. So in the different uh, chapters, obviously you, uh, you cover the different areas of conflict, healing and passion. Uh, what did that conflict represent for you um, and what section of the book uh, is tied to uh, that? Yeah, event? well, I noticed that some of the dances were about conflicts or battles. And I thought, well, gosh, that really does reflect life, doesn't it? We all go through battles or conflicts in our lives. Um, the pandemic was a huge conflict for me personally, because everything was canceled. All the tours for Allegro were canceled. I lost all my dancers. Uh, you know, because I couldn't keep them on board for not performing anywhere. So I, I lost everything, jobs, you know, finances, all of that just kind of went down the drain. So that was a huge conflict for me, mm -hmm. um, along with everybody else, I'm sure is feeling that as well. But I was trying to figure out, well, how am I going to still preserve these dances if nobody's dancing out there, nobody's performing? So I kept thinking. And so I started turning to the internet, of course, like everybody else and started teaching on zoom and created a whole studio virtually. And so I had dance students from New York to California wanting to line up to learn how to Tarantella, which was impressive to me. I thought, well, there's more people out there that really wants to learn this. And they were Italian American students, young students that didn't even know it existed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and some students that still stop me and say, I didn't even know Italian folk dance existed. Like that was a thing. So I, I think that that really the conflict, I, I had my own answer to it. it. It turned out well, but it definitely was a conflict at first, you know, what to do. Indeed. And then, you know, kind of there's a little bit of the, uh, a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. We're talking about healing uh so obviously things started to maybe pick up again or in a different uh, uh way as you said uh, the, right. uh, going online has given a lot of small businesses the ability to reach out a broader um, audience thus pushing our mission out to a broader audience and uh, also when you said that you staged your your studio you know drops probably carefully placed uh, oh gosh yes <laughs> you probably know that I, I bought a dance floor I fixed up my basement I painted walls yeah you made a virtual dance studio here where people could zoom in yes and talking about props that leads me to uh there is a nice little story um about a prop of I guess a giant uh a shoe ballerina shoe can you tell us a little bit and then maybe I'll give a couple of lines about the company that supported your your vision yeah, I was doing oh, some, trying to do? mm -hmm. yeah, I was trying to do some research, um, but I was looking down after a rehearsal and looked at my shoes and I thought I've been wearing the Bezio shoes for, I don't know, since I was four or five years old. And so I looked down and thought, I wonder if they have a story. This sounds Italian. I, I don't know a whole lot about the company at at the time. So I researched them and found out that Salvatore Capizio came to the United States around the same time my grandparents did. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and always anyone that is within remotely connected to any form of dance, not just the ballerina dance, um, right. probably has heard or has a pair of capezzo shoes in their closets. So um, yes, we can. Uh, I can share with the audience some information about how capezzo started because uh, the 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 company, the capezzo ballet makers, that's how they're called, also um, began as a teeny tiny shop in. New York, uh, run by a teenage Italian immigrant. Uh, right. Salvatore Capezio was born in 1871 in the town of Bruno Lucania Potenza. And uh, he trained as a cobbler and came to the United States as a, a young man. And he set up shop on Broadway and 39th uh, Street in New York in uh, 1887, when he was only 17 years old. And the shop was called the Theatrical and Historical Shoemaker. And uh, even though Capezio at first did not uh, specialize in dance shoes, his shop was located kitty corner to the Metropolitan Opera House. And the mad singers and dancers uh, began bringing him uh, their shoes for repair. And one day he made an emergency pair of shoes for the danzos uh, Jean de Resque. Capetio's um, exemplary work for the de Resques consolidated his reputation at, uh, within the Met crowd. And before long, he was not only repairing sh uh, stage shoes, but also making shoes himself, including crafting pointed uh, shoes uh, to order for the ballerinas. Um, Later, um, in I believe 1902, he married a ballerina, um, Angelina Passone, and this made the Capezzo shop even more of a magnet for the New York dance uh, company. Uh, the shop and the Capezzo name earned indelible fame when the Russian ballerina Anna Pavlova visited in 1910. And she was, Pavlova was the most celebrated ballerina of her era and already world famous when she began her US tour that year. And she had a Capezzo make shoes for her and the whole company that's given the highest possible star endorsement to the brand. So the Capezio company keeps a frame letter from Pavlova uh, from 1915 in which she wrote that Capezio's theatrical shoes were indeed the best I have ever had. So you have this company, you have this idea, what happened? <laughs> right, so I thought, oh, that would be really cool to tell their love story through movement, through a ballet. And I'm going to contact the company to see if they had some kind of cardboard cutout or something I could put in the background quickly, you know, a tour, you know, something just really simplistic um, to showcase, you know, the brand name and the shoe that they kind of fell in love with over. <laughs> so I sent an email just on their website, just through information, it was something really generic. And I didn't hear anything back, but I didn't expect anything. I really didn't. I just thought, well, I'm just going to go about it and just tell the story and we'll just create, create maybe our own prop or something simple. And then I got a phone call. My email traveled all the way to the top to the CEO of the company and left a message on my answering system. And I Viviana, I almost fainted. I can't imagine. <laughs> because this is a brand I, I've been wearing for years and years and years since I was a little girl. And I thought, what, why are they calling me? <laughs> <laughs> and it was the CEO. And he said, you know, please give me a call back. And I'd love to talk about your project. And so I took a deep breath or two, or maybe four <laughs> and, <laughs> and called back, you know, nervously and he said, tell me more about your company. I've never heard of anything like this, like anybody doing this kind of research and commending me for doing that. And I said, well, to me, it was a no brainer. I'm Italian American. I love dance. I was like two plus two is four, you know? And he said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I really wanted to tell the love story of your great uncle. And, um, and I just wanted to background some kind of backdrop or a little shoe or something to put on stage to show, you know, about the story. And he's like, 
give me all the sizes of all of your dancers. I'm sending you a box of shoes. Wow. So <laughs> they sponsored us that year. And uh, this giant box a few days later showed up on my doorstep of ballet slippers and jazz shoes for the gentleman and a giant sign that said Capizio and, mm-hmm. you know, a beautiful letter saying congratulations and good luck on your tour and all of that great stuff. And I just, I didn't know what to do with myself at that point. <laughs> you probably did another turn tell events. <laughs> I did, you know, and we took pictures at every stop along that tour and we sent him photographs and um, his daughter uh, sent me an email because I think he was ill at the time, you know, when we were touring. So um, he wasn't able to make our show. He really wanted to see one of our shows, but his daughter sent me an email and he, she wanted to relay the message that she said, Anna, you're, your pictures that you sent are sitting on his desk right next next to like the Broadway show people. And I thought, you're kidding me. You're kidding me. She said, no, they're those photos that you sent. And, you know, it's Allegro dance company sitting next to a picture of, you know, the Broadway cast of wicked or whatever and the Rockettes and whoever else that they shoe. And I thought, Oh my goodness, that's, this is wild. This is really crazy. So I was really honored to do that. Wow, that that uh, indeed, it's a it's a fantastic uh, uh, story because again, uh, it shows that even you know big companies um, they are so willing to help out the preservation of their origins because again yeah. we just, uh, uh, heard about how uh, the Capezio. Uh, or company um, started. And it's always that one person that um, had the courage to, um, you know, sometimes leave their home behind or go into an in, uh, innovative uh, way, um, innovative business or uh, path in, uh, in life. Um, before you, when we were quickly mentioned, maybe this is taking off the, the book about the, the gardens and your, grandpa- uh, your grandparents, um, how important is uh, uh, family for you? Oh my goodness, it's everything. It's number one. <laughs> it's number one. Yeah, that mm-hmm. garden was something. And uh, that was a place where you could play. You know, mm-hmm. that was a place where I could help do the seeds and pick the tomatoes. I couldn't wait it was just, it seemed like forever until those tomatoes came about. Right. But Especially when you're a little girl, uh, yeah. two days is, uh, feels like two years. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, by the end of the summer, or early September, I would see those red tomatoes pop up and I, I would just pull my skirt out or, or shirt out and put all the tomatoes like and stack them up. And it just, nothing else tastes like that. Nothing think- else. And I think, you know, in, in addition to the genuinity of the, the, the product is because you have memories. Um, oh, absolutely. Sweeter, the same thing about cooking where people say the secret ingredients is always love. It's not <laughs> about following the cups and, and, and teaspoons. And um, uh, that is clearly the message that came about um, also with the heirloom documentary. That it's not about just... Uh, you know, having the perfect heirloom tomato, right? But that, that we internally want to recreate something that we have fond memories of with the people that uh, that we indeed uh, love and meant um, so much. Yeah, uh, it's the us. same connection. You want to make a connection, and that's what the dances do as well. We make those connections with the past, and mm-hmm. I think that's what a garden does. You know, you make that connection with the past. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a nice way to remember, you know, remember them and honor them and, and mm-hmm. keep it going. Yes, indeed. Um, another interesting thing about your, your book is that at uh, the end of every uh, chapter, you give also some reflection points to um, people that are indeed uh, reading that chapter and the book. Uh, and I'm going to take some of those questions and ask them to you to see Perfect. if you have done your reflection, your homework. <laughs> so um, one, um, who do you let in your circle? That's a good one. That's really That good. is a good one. And um, <laughs> because of dance, I've noticed that, you know, the dancers kind of became my circle of family besides my real family the dancers became my new family, my dance family. So that's 
who's always in my circle, you know, who's there for you because they know the the trials that you go through. They know how hard you're working because they're working right beside you. So those are the people that really usually are in my dance circle or my, my personal circle too. Uh, another very good one. How do you take chances in life and what pushes you outside of your comfort zone? Things that push me outside of my comfort zone are usually those conflicts. You know, how am I going to solve this problem? So it makes me think, well, I have to go past my comfort zone, like writing an email to Capizio <laughs> and then, you know, accepting, Hey, this could open up a door to something really big. Are you ready for that? Yeah. And so you never know, take those chances because I've seen that taking those small chances really turn out well. And uh, actually that takes uh, already answers the next, que next uh, question. When was the last time you met a stranger who gave you a gift and meant everything to you? And I think the Capezio story. Right. Uh, have you ever helped a stranger find something? Yeah, absolutely. I was in, um, I was in a Washington DC and um, waiting on a bus and a, a deaf student, I think he was a college student, came up to me and send, you know, showed me a text of, you know, do you know which bus this is? And I sign a little bit. I'm not great at it, but I do know a little sign language um, mm -hmm. from taking dance and, and studying with students that are deaf. And so I helped him find his bus mm -hmm. and I didn't know him at all. <laughs> so I, I tapped him and made sure he got on the correct bus for his trip. Uh, another good one. I think we touched upon it. How do you honor your loved ones? Oh my goodness. That garden is a constant year round memory for me. I have a little small garden in my, in my kitchen on the counter, just of herbs, you know, and I think just seeing that every day is a good way to a small thing to do it. A small way to honor. Yeah. Do you listen to your inner voice about decisions? Not always. That's hard. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm learning to do that more often. Yes, there is. A, I'm a Sagittarius. So, so there's always the conflict between kind of the human and the Sagittarian. And, uh, you know, there are certain things that I have to be very logic about, but others Thanks. that your gut feeling tells you take a chance. And yeah. uh, um, even because, I mean, it's nice to ask for advice from others, but if you really feel, if you really follow your heart, there cannot be any bad outcome because no matter what happens, you chose it. So you can't blame others. And I've That's never, right. um, I've taken chances. I came to the US on a hundred dollar bet. Come on. Um, <laughs> and um, um, I didn't have any expectations, but I can say it didn't turn out that bad after all. That's right. That's right. You're doing pretty good, Viviana. You're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, obviously uh, when it's a kind of show season and we'll talk a little bit about that um, and in addition to the folk dances you also uh, teach yoga and Pilates but what do you do to unwind and uh, reflect on your day? Um, I think since the pandemic besides yoga I think I've done a little bit of writing even if it's just journaling you know, every day and a practice of gratitude. And it's something that I've instilled in the dancers to um, find three things that you're grateful for every day, mm -hmm. even if they're tiny. Yeah. That's to me, that makes a difference. You're more of a person that fight or fly in a serious uh, situation? Um, fight so far. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how the rest of the year goes. <laughs> Um, talking about, uh, uh, you know, now um, everyone is coming out and finally enjoying the outdoors, the performances and the festivals. Uh, you have a full calendar. Um, what, uh, where are you going to be performing uh, next? Where can people uh, come and, and see your beautiful uh, dances? Yeah, we've done a performance in Pittsburgh already in June, and we have a couple um, performances in Washington, Pennsylvania, uh, July 8th uh, for the baseball game with the Washington Wild Things. And then the 9th, we're going to be in Canton, Ohio. And then later on in the summer, um, early fall, September 4th is a Sunday. We'll be in Clarksburg, West Virginia for their Italian festival in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then um, September 24th, if anybody's around this area, uh, Washington, Pennsylvania, they have their beautiful little Italian festival here in Washington, PA. 
um, and that's September 24th. And we're performing at 1.45 in the afternoon mm -hmm. where you can see a handful of those uh, folk dances that I talked about and um, a little bit more. We're doing a couple solos and things that are um, a jazz or a modern feel uh, to give a little range of like Italy's not stuck in the past. Italy is still progressing forward and they love other kinds of music. So we tell other stories. Um, there's a solo that's called Passeggiata mm -hmm. that I talk about in the book that I've, I thought, well, maybe that should be a dance this year's tour. So, you know, how do we walk with our family after dinner? You know, what is your hopes and dreams that you think about on that walk? So we put it into a solo this year. Oh, that's wonderful. I can't, uh, I can't wait. And uh, also the, the book is going around. Uh, it is also within uh, uh, the Heinz History Center now. Right, you can and, shop there. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed. And uh, um, do you have any other book signing sessions uh, scheduled? I do. In August, I'll be in Bridgeport, West Virginia at their library on Friday, August 5th from two to four. I'll be there book signing and chatting up with about the book and the culture. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be at the Italian festival September 3rd. They have an author's forum um, in Clarksburg, West Virginia, where other authors, other Italian authors are going to be there talking about their books. And so you can hear a little bit about all of our journeys and our books and then, you know, also get a book signing. But August 6th, if you're in the Pittsburgh area, Peter's Township. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Their library on August 6th is Eat Local, Read Local. So mm -hmm. I was one of the authors that they picked. And I think it's from 11 a.m. to 1. Yeah. Maybe we'll post some links. And yeah. 11 a.m. to 1. And they have food trucks and all kinds of authors that are going to be there book signing and chatting. And so mm -hmm. stop by my booth and, you know, pick up a book and chat about your heritage. Even if you're not Italian, you know, you came yeah, from somewhere. I, yes, I went to a wedding that had a, a, a Slovakian flair to it. And uh, so we found ourselves in circles doing the call events. And then my husband is from Turkey. And uh, it's beautiful to go to any event or anything. It's actually the gentlemen that get on the dance floor even before the women. There is no about trying to drag your partner on. That's the right. Floor. They are the first ones to, and they are so, uh, the costumes also are spectacular. Uh, you're also a fellow um, 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 host um, for your um, podcast. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the dance floor? Yeah, my podcast has started. Um, it's called The Dance Floor, and it's where I talk about life lessons that we've learned through the art of dance. And I have all kinds of people telling their journeys, you know, that we're not alone um, from singers to musicians, painters, writers, that they all take this journey to be that artistic endeavor and um, what they've learned along the way and how they pass on that advice to the next generation, which is always my motto, you know, what can I learn and how can I pass it on to somebody else so that their journey is a little bit easier? Do you find yourself uh, taking notes? And uh, I do, I mean, uh, constantly. And uh, uh, just maybe it's that innate principle that was instilled in us by our parents associate yourselves always with someone that knows more than you do. Do you find that to be indeed a driving factor also in your in your life? Always, always. I'm always looking for, hey, you know, so and so knows something I'd love to learn from them. I'm always taking notes and I call it my personal university. And mm -hmm. through the pandemic, it really has helped me. Um, I've met some fantastic people across the United States that have shared tips and tricks that you know, I'm paying attention to as well. I'm learning along with the, the listeners. So it's definitely something I'm taking notes on and um, always learning. We should always be learning though. Indeed. So one last question, um, Anna, what's in your wish list right now? Or what do you want your next year to be like? Yeah, well, next year, I'm hoping that the second book comes out and maybe I'll interview a little bit of you <laughs> of Northern Italy. I'm going to talk about my trips and travels through Northern Italy, you know, from Rome and on up and how those dances, like we talked about, are a little different and the escapades that I've had, the troubles and tribulations that I, you know, had to go through to get those dances, um, but just some funny stories and that sort of thing. So that's what I'm working on now. And hopefully that'll be out next year. And 
touring and auditioning new dancers for another brand new tour next year makes our 30th anniversary for Allegro. So what? celebrating 30 years <laughs> on the road. Um, that, that is a lot because uh, again, in a, this, um, going and touring has a completely different dimension and aspects that just what we uh, audience and spectators um, appreciate and enjoy on stage, the dedication, the fatigue, the driving, the making things work. <laughs> sure, every day the is trying to make it work. The weather, oh my gosh, yes. We've been through it all. Um, and I have some alumni that are coming back and bringing their children now to oh. dance. So I'm going to call them Petite Allegro. <laughs> so there are Piccolini, you know, that will come back, um, you know, the alumni and bringing their children. So I'm excited to see them and meet their kids and, and see what, how it has affected their lives just by being in Allegro, just a small blip in their life, but it really has changed for some of them. It was a stepping stone to their next journey. So I'm honored and pleased about it. Uh, do you have any of the dancers that you obviously you say that you kind of keep in touch, but <clears throat> any of the dancers that uh, have contributed to uh, Allegra for some time that have gone off to their dance career? And Oh, yeah. Imagine. Oh, yeah. We have people dancing in New York. There's a um, person that now makes clothes because she she started out with costumes with me and now she's making suits and stuff in New York. Um, there's, uh, some of the dancers became models. <laughs> I have a, another dancer that is now in movies. So it is, it's their first stepping stone into that taste of professionalism. And I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, I'm so glad that I, I gave them that opportunity because I wish somebody would have given me that opportunity <laughs> when I was in, you know, high school or college. So, yeah. Well, Anna, this has been such a pleasant uh, conversation, and uh, I'm sure our listeners will follow what uh, uh, Allegro Dance is going to do, what you're going to bring on stage for all of us. We'll post some links and some dates, so I highly encourage everyone to go. And if Anna says, get off your chair and come and dance, please right. do that. <laughs> yeah, join our circle. Um, we give workshops too, so don't be afraid to ask, you know. We do workshops all the time at festivals and, and things. So join us. Yes. And I remember also when we did a virtual uh, workshop with you for our summer uh, camp and our kids just loved it. Even when we disconnected, it is, uh, <laughs> we yeah, kept always and dancing. So that's right. There's always a way to connect. Indeed. So, uh, di nuovo, grazie, Anna. In bocca al lupo per tutto. Best luck with everything. Grazie. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, our hour is up. Il Big Ben ha detto stop. It's time for us to say arrivederci e alla prossima. We want to thank you for tuning in to the program. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please contact us at the Italian Radio Hour at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Remember, if you or your family and friends have missed a prior episode or would like to listen to this episode again, please visit, visit us um, online at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org and click on the Radio Hour tab. Now, our guest for next week uh, will be best-selling author Sarah Gay Forden, the author of The House of Gucci, who recently was turned into a movie, and Professor Salvatore Giardina with the New York Fashion Institute of Technology. So you don't want to miss this episode filled with glamour, menace, and, and greed. And finally, before we leave, here is our trivia question for next week. Uh, what does non c'è due senza tre mean? And again, what does non c'è due senza tre mean? You can send in your answers to the Italian Radio Hour at gmail.com. If you're not living in the Pittsburgh area or might be out of town, remember you can always catch us streaming live at khbradio.com every Thursday at five o'clock. And be sure to like us on Instagram and Facebook at Italian Radio Hour. Until next time, alla prossima. Ciao, ciao.